Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Nick Lugo Show, where I study the tactics, practices, and principles of some of my favorite achievers. Today, I bring on a friend and a fellow podcaster, Kenny Soto, who really, well, he knows. He knows about digital marketing. He's a digital marketing expert and the host of the podcast, The People of Digital Marketing. He has all the tips and all the tricks for people who are looking to just start out a podcast in 2022 and really, really grow their podcast and be consistent. We offer so many tips, so many tricks of things that we both struggle with in the beginning and how to overcome them. This goes from failing to get guests, failing to use your guests as a resource, inconsistency, neglecting marketing, and working alone. All these things are really, really difficult, and, well, they're things that both of us struggled at the same time in the beginning, and we've told, well, we're going to tell everybody here how to overcome them and how to start a podcast that is consistent and works well. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. Make sure to check out the the links in the the, the sponsors in the description below, and make sure to give me a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Enjoy this podcast with Kenny Soto. All right, so what were we talking about? We were talking about optimizing our podcasts because we both are podcast hosts and behind the scenes, a lot of people who are podcast fans, they only see the end product. They don't necessarily see all of the hard work that goes into scheduling, vetting guests, editing the podcast and thinking of topics and questions to ask in the future. So I think that's what we were talking about in general, right before we started recording. Okay, so tell yeah. me what what exactly are you struggling with, and what exactly are you trying to trying to do as you're navigating through this space? So my podcast is not necessarily like super niche, right? Because I feel like sometimes people can pick a subject, and then that subject might pigeonhole them so much so that there's like little flexibility in terms of guests, and that makes it so that after a certain while you're scrambling to find someone to have on your podcast. If you're doing like a weekly podcast, for example, my subject is all about digital marketing. And luckily for me, digital marketing is such a broad term that I can have guests who are TikTok creators, people who work specifically in advertising, people who work with e-commerce, et cetera, et cetera. And there are a lot of people out there who want to learn about digital marketing. So I have like a potential pool of people that I can have both as guests and listeners, I've unlocked the process of getting quality guests. That's something that I'm good at. That's something that I'm not worried about anymore. My next challenge, which I'm sure you can talk about too, is finding more listeners. And I don't want to do the spray and pray method of trying to get as much people as possible, as fast as possible. I'm okay with getting at least three to five listeners a week. And that's currently my challenge is actually achieving that because right now I'm getting three to seven listeners a month. And that is a a quality audience because right now I think I have like 81, 82 active listeners monthly that are like consistent and they're always listening to my episodes. But I haven't really cracked the code of that exponential growth line where the ultimate goal is I'm doing this podcast 10 years into the future and every single person who is in marketing or wants to become a marketer knows my name. Yeah. Yeah. So first explain actually, so we're actually in similar spots because yes, Mm -hmm. I've figured out the whole guest, like getting on guests. That's the biggest thing that that's the easy part too. Yeah. So tell me, first of all, especially for beginner podcasters, how'd you figure it out? What were, what were sort of the tactics that you did to figure it out? So I'll start off by saying that If you are starting a podcast and you want or your idea is to do a podcast by yourself, there are people who can successfully do that, but it's very rare that they're successful in doing so because most podcasts are successful because you're having a conversation. And if I think right now, the only person I've seen who can do a podcast by themselves successfully is Bill Burr, the comedian. And that's because he's funny. And although he sometimes talks about like serious topics, you know, the entertainment value is always going to be top 10% of all comedians who live right now. So there's an expectation that comes with him and his personal brand that like you can't beat or even replicate. So if your attempt for creating a podcast is to be a one man show, good luck, all the power to you, but you might have to do 2000 episodes just to break even and start getting an audience. So the opposite of that is 
having guests on your podcast. And I think for the beginner podcast host, what you really need to lock down on is not what equipment you have, because that's easy to get. Yep. It's not necessarily what niche you're going to do, because again, like I mentioned earlier, it's really easy to pick a niche so long as you're more in the middle of broad and specific. So you can have like some wiggle room. It's really thinking about what unique questions are you going to ask that no one else can ask. And it may seem daunting at first. And this is something that I would definitely like do my own research on. There's a great person by the name of Jack Butcher. He is Jack Butcher on Twitter, if I'm not mistaken. And he's also Visualized Value is his his store on Twitter as well. He used to be a graphic designer at an agency and he started his own business, literally blowing up on Twitter because he would take graphic design and philosophy to very broad topics and he combined them so he would take quotes on stoicism and he would visualize the values of stoicism then in turn he would take uh quotes from like steve jobs and visualize the key lessons that he was trying to convey into these awesome simple black and white posters and then he started selling them online he sold them as posters as uh iphone backgrounds and people started paying him And what I learned from him is, and he talks about this on his YouTube channel as well, everyone has a blob of uniqueness, right? Where you have things that you believe are obvious, but you have to keep in mind what you believe is obvious is specific to your life. That's where your value comes from because other people don't see what you see. And what's obvious to you isn't obvious to other people which is why I believe to some degree, most people, at least people who work in tech will also be content creators at the same time, just to stay in the game and to stay competitive. Because at the end of the day, everyone has a resume. I think a lot of people are becoming more aware of personal branding too. So a lot of people have online portfolios, they have LinkedIn, they're like, it's, it's, it's a trend that's growing. I believe Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Like, so you're sort of saying that um, one of the big things, and I think this is the thing I struggle with in the beginning. And we were talking about this before the podcast, the things that we're both struggling with is sort of the fact that when you start a podcast, you kind of do it by yourself. It's kind of lonely. It's kind of difficult. And there's no collaboration involved. You know, it's really, really difficult to, you know, just run it by yourself. First of all, the consistency is really difficult, but at the same time, just it's so difficult to acquire knowledge and gain resources when you're just doing it by yourself. So sort of explain, yeah, why, first of all, is this a big thing that you think most podcasters struggle with? And then second of all, how do we sort of alleviate that? And what sort of collaboration tactics and resource gaining tools have you sort of achieved over the years? So I think I have a specific advantage. My podcast is business focused. And although it's marketing, I I feel like There's other people out there talking about customer support, talking about building apps, running whole companies in operation. And if you're starting off Twitter and LinkedIn, free tools, their search functionality is so sophisticated that you can find quality people. If you just sit down, maybe two hours, I think it's two hours a week for me right now. I'll sit down and I have already planned out who are the next 200 people in the marketing world that I'm going to reach out to and in what schedule I'm going to reach out to them by wow. based on first, I think you can, you can mix and match this based on what you want to do first. For me, it's always topics and then people. So I know for 2022, I've, I haven't had guests on paid media. I haven't had guests on enough guests on graphic design. So those are two pillars that I want to focus on for 2022 So for each pillar, I have 20 to 25 guests. Wow. And I already already have them cataloged. I haven't reached out to them yet. Wow. But that saves me so much time for next year because now I know when it's January, here are the 25 people I need to reach out to. And this this is an important topic that I think people sort of underestimate in terms of getting things done is batching. 
batching. Yeah. That's exactly what you're, exactly. you're describing. So you're describing yeah. yes, getting a large amount of things done, putting an entire sort of yes process and just getting it done in two, three hours and just banging it out. Because yes, exactly. most people sort of, you know, they want to do the whole process in, in a small amount of time. No, no. Instead, just s- put it into individual steps and then bang it out from there. Exactly. And I think if you are considering doing a podcast, I would ask yourself, well, you should ask yourself, excuse me, how long do you plan on doing this podcast? When I started my podcast in 2020, uh, yeah, 2020. Wow. It was already last year. Um, I, I started off with thinking, okay, so if I'm going to do this podcast for 10 years, what does that look like? Mm. Who are my big shot guests that I want when I'm in year eight, nine, and 10, how do I get there? Who are the mid tier guests? Can I maybe skip the line and cheat my way into getting a Gary Vaynerchuk, for example, on my podcast? Perhaps, but then if I'm thinking about all of these things in a long, long-term um, timeline, I don't need to rush the process. My goal would be one day to have Gary on the podcast, to have Noah Kagan, to have Seth Godin, all these big marketers that are titans in the field. But in order to get there, there are probably, I want to say, a thousand other people I can talk to, learn from, create content with. So that when I do reach out to these big titans of industry, they're like, oh, this kid is serious and he has quality content that has grown over time. So if you're a new podcast host, you want to ask yourself, is this a podcast I'm going to do for three months or is this a podcast I'm going to do for a decade? Well, so I think you hit on a really important, we'll say, problem that people experience as they're starting up, which is this problem of consistency right? Being able to start up and really being able to, you know, hammer down and really get one thing posted every week, bi-weekly, whatever they want. I notice a lot of people really, really struggle with this. So first of all, did you have any struggles with this and how did you sort of get over it? So my first struggle was I started off my podcast as an audio journal. And okay. I thought that like that was the route I was going to go because it's the route I took with my blog. And before my podcast, I did a blog for five years. And the reason why I started my podcast was because my blog wasn't getting any readers. And I saw, okay, I did the consistency part, but after a certain while, you have to basically come to terms with the fact that maybe that medium that you're trying out doesn't work. So I always tell anyone who's interested in doing a blog, YouTube channel, or podcast, do it for a year. And at the worst case scenario, if life is too hectic for you to do it weekly, do it monthly. Because if you cannot do 12 episodes, 12 blog posts, or 12 podcast interviews within a year, you're not taking it seriously and you're wasting your own time. Yep. Yep. So I think that's basically it. So that's one of the things that I sort of, I sort of struggled with was, yeah, I mean, I never really, so in the beginning, right. I spent a lot of time, if we're talking about guests, I was trying to rope in guests every single week when I had a post by Sunday. So let's say it was Tuesday and I'm trying to find my guest for that Sunday. And first of all, you're not getting a high quality guest in six days when you have a small podcast. Yes, it's not exactly. happening. And second yeah. of all, yeah, you know what? It's, it's really, it was really, really stressful to, to really wait till the last minute like that. So for me, the consistency problem that I experienced was getting guests every single week. I never did the batching. I never looked too far in the future because I was always in what I would call survival mode, right? There were were points where I would hit up my friends and be like, hey, would you mind coming on the podcast just for this week because I need it? And um, and yeah, I mean, I had no, I had no way of really doing it every single week. So I definitely do not actually recommend the whole monthly thing. Cause I don't know if that's how you did it, but when I did for the month, when I realized, okay, you know what, if I'm going to do it for the monthly thing, then I'm just going to drop off. Like for me. For yeah. Me it's not for everyone, Nick. Sorry to interrupt. Mm-hmm. It's not for everyone, but I would say the monthly is the bare minimum to do. If you're unsure of yourself, if you know that you want to be a podcast host It's been an idea that's been itching at the back of your head for ages and you're just trying to get started and you don't know how that passion will be an indicator that, yes, you need to do the biweekly or weekly, not necessarily the monthly. 
But the monthly is for the person who is thinking about dabbling, wants to do the experiment, but they're too busy and they just want to see what would happen if they did the monthly. Obviously, you'd get faster and better results, better quality content if you did it consistent consistently on a week by week basis. But for the person who may be just considering it and wants to dip their toes, I would say keep the idea of consistency and do it monthly. And if you see after month four, hey, you can do this every week, then start doing it every week. But yeah. it's just a lot of people I find, and, and this is something that I had to deal with myself too. You will have an idea. And the reason why you won't do it is because you think there has to be this whole apparatus, this whole system, this whole plan, where most of the time the plan happens as you go. I agree, actually. I, I agree completely. I mean, you know, I'm I'm a, uh, we'll say, do first and ask for permission later type of guy. Yes. And I think that is the perfect way to do it because it just, life is so much, yeah, like fear will really, really hold you back. And the reason why I think most podcasters don't get started is because they're like, ah, I don't know how I'm going to get my first two episodes out there. And I want it to be absolutely perfect. And I want it to be like this and exactly like that. And, and, you know, no, no, just if you listen to my first podcast episode, I didn't listen to yours, but if you listen to my number one first pause podcast episode, it is terrible. It is so Minus bad. Two. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Like it, I had air buds and my microphone was through the air buds and my audio quality was terrible. And just, it was, it was really, really awful. The guy who I had on was in the car and the Wi-Fi kept cutting in and out. You know, it was just, you know, it wasn't the best, but that was the thing. I just got started. And yep. now I'm sitting here with, you know, at the moment, 94 episodes posted 115 e episodes scheduled. And, um, and it's just, I got the consistency down. And I think that's the biggest thing that everybody struggles with is just sort of getting started and then sort of roping it in for the consistency. Yeah. Another, another thing that I would recommend is, and this is something I didn't do, but I, I'm, I'm mad I didn't do it in the first place, was before you start, have about six episodes uh, loaded up. So your first, yeah. like when you, when the first one goes out and you press set, like, you know, I'm introducing my podcast, have four or five sort of in the queue. And if you do that, then it would really, really, you know, give you some positive momentum. So you don't have to sort of shoestring every week. Yeah. One thing I, I would also add to that is you want to make sure you have at least six, maybe seven podcast uh, episodes in the queue, because sometimes life happens. And yep. if you are the host, which in most cases, the whoever's listening and who wants to become a podcast host will be the host, you might get sick. There might be a family emergency you might get bogged down with other obligations. And that means that you might have to take a week or two off of actually actively recording episodes in order to manage those other expectations you have around life. And having that cue already set and scheduled and automated within your podcasting app so that each week, you know, on Wednesday at 9 a.m., it's going to be fine. I don't need to actually be actively um, recording this week because I have the next six weeks planned out. That's going to help you out tremendously and actually reduce the amount of stress. So you have more time to think about the future and making sure that the trajectory of your podcast is at least on a positive trend. Do you want to hear what Tim Ferriss does? What does he do? So Tim Ferriss does a content creation week. So if we're talking about batching, he literally okay. puts all of his podcasts for the quarter. So for the next three months within one, one week, week, one week. So 12, 12 episodes, seven days. And what is he doing? He's batching. So he doesn't have to, yes, focus on prepping and doing everything throughout his weeks. Instead, he's just one week, get everything done, put everything else on pause and, and get all your podcasts recorded for that month, for that, for the next three months. And, yep. um, and then, and then for the next quarter, right. For the next 11 weeks, he has energy and time to focus on other things. Exactly. And that's, that's, that's actually what I've been doing. So ever since I got into Tim Ferriss's stuff a lot more recently, I, um, I have 20 episodes in my queue right now and well, 20 episodes recorded. Right. And now my next, we'll say 11 weeks is focused on the other parts of the podcast. So yes, marketing, social media, you know, um, 
creating good titles, creating good Mm -hmm. keywords, all of these things. And the point is that I don't have to focus every single week, putting all my attention like I did in the beginning on getting guests and recording episodes. Now it's just, okay, there are so many other facets, so many other parts of this podcast. And, um, and I'm going to focus on those now that I, that, that I have everything else batched up. Yeah, honestly, I think batching, not just with podcasting, but with life, if you can batch, you should try to, it's just yeah. going to help with like ease of mind, less okay. stress. So let me ask you. So one thing that I have been struggling with, and this is something that's on my personal agenda or one of my batching experiments that I need to do more is the idea of podcast guests, right? So you have these podcast guests and they come on. And first of all, if you're batching, then you're not going to post it for a while. So there's a really long gap in between those, the first conversation of, Hey, we had a great podcast. You know, it's, I'd love to talk to you more until, Hey, I'm posting. Second of all, what do you do with these podcast guests? Like, do you, you know, Tim Ferriss says 80, 80% of his current guests don't come from cold emails anymore. Now they're referrals. So one guest will refer another guest and that's how it sort of comes on. So how do you sort of, you know, what do you do after you get on uh, a call with the podcast guest and how do you sort of manage this whole um, using the podcast guest as a resource? We'll say. So, after every single recording of my podcast, I ask each guest, if you know two people who you think are amazing marketers and would be great mentors for other marketers, could you refer them to me so I can interview them as well? And immediately they will go on LinkedIn or via email, but most of the time it's LinkedIn and they'll send a DM to them and myself with that introduction. And I take it from there. Um, as far as any other interactions are concerned, I always make sure that I follow the guest on LinkedIn or Twitter and engage with their content with the expectation that whenever I'm interviewing anyone, I know for a fact a 25 to 30 minute interview is not enough to get all of the value that's inside their head. Yep. And because of these people being voracious readers, constant learners. They're trying to be the top experts in marketing. I know the next time I interview them, I'm guaranteed to get new value from anything that they've learned between that time period of me recording them the first time and then the second time. So I think it's a two-pronged approach where one, when I interview a guest, either whether they came in through the network of previous guests or I reach out to them cold, I always ask them, do they know two people? because they definitely know at least one, but I asked for two just in case, two other people that can be guests. And at the same time, I'm constantly engaging with them and keeping them fresh in my mind and having a catalog of my past guests so that I can interview them for round two and potentially around three, knowing that I'm trying to get to like that Joe Rogan level of 1,500 to maybe even 2,000 episodes one day in 10 years time. So, so that's kind of... Um... There's a lot to unpack there, right? Yeah. So first of all, how do you make the ask, right? When you ask for two people, do you say, you know, what is sort of the verbiage? And yeah, I, I noticed I try to do the same thing, but it doesn't work out as well. Yeah. So, so I mean, I've never gotten a no. So I always just ask, well, at the end of each episode, I say, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Um, here's the expected week that this might come out, which is usually a month, maybe a month and a half in the future. And right before they're about to leave, I say, hey, Um, I always ask this of every single guest, if you have the chance, could you introduce me to two people who you think are great marketers and would be perfect guests for the show? And I got lucky, I guess, because each time I ask that, they always refer me to two people. I've had one person refer me to five people, which is amazing. So it just depends on the guest. But I, I do find that if they enjoyed the interview, they will definitely refer you to other people as well. Got it. Got it. So yeah. yes, I never asked for two. I think the two is a very, um, it's, it's a, a very specific number. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it's not like, Hey, if you have anybody that, that you think I want to enjoy people. this, I want two people. Right. And, yeah. and can you, can you, fo- do they foster the connection? Do they say, Hey, this is, you know, make a group chat yeah. of three and say, Hey, this is Kenny. Yep. Always. And it's always is most of the time on LinkedIn, sometimes on email. Okay. Got it. So LinkedIn and then email. So, yeah. All right. And then second part about it. So, uh, the part twos. So I, um, 
I've been starting to do that a lot more recently, the part twos, just because, first of all, yes, there's a lot of value that you can extract from a part two of a conversation. But at the same time, yeah, like I just um I just don't get it how um how I could foster a long-term friendship with somebody via one conversation, right? One one hour podcast conversation. So um so yeah, do you think the part twos are a good solution to that? Or do you have anything else? So I know that not all of my guests will have a part two, Mm -hmm. but what I do to like gauge whether or not I want to do a second round is based on personal interest and how many people listened to the podcast. So for example, um, I recently interviewed last year, or maybe I think it was March of this year, Amanda Getz. She is the founder of House of Wise. She used to be the VP of marketing at The Knot, which is a wedding company. And she is going through a unique business challenge where not only does she have a startup who, which is selling a physical product, so it's D to C, direct to consumer, but it's also CBD. And the CBD industry, in, and, and, and this, it could, I can go really deep in the weeds here, but in general, like for example, her Facebook advertising process, most people can create advertising, post it, it goes through manual review within four hours, and then it's launched. She has to go through so many layers of manual review because she's selling a CBD product. Mm -hmm. And I know that I only scratched the surface when I interviewed her. So she's someone I'm going to have a second time on the podcast because I know the next time I have her on, we're not going to talk about necessarily all the challenges of marketing a CBD product. We can talk about in the past six months, six months, excuse me, you've grown your business to XYZ revenue, how did you do it? And then there's a story that connects to part one to part two. The the listeners have already signaled through how many people have listened that they're interested in her. And that's how I kind of gauge it, either through personal interest or through the audience's reaction. Got it. Got it. Yeah. All right. So now let's let's take a little left turn and go to social media. So okay. how do you how do you advertise yourself on social media and what is sort of your uh, method on that? So I'm, I've been marketing for about seven years now. And how old you are, by the way, I'm, I'm 28 years old. And I, I would say that being completely honest, social media has changed so much in the past six years of me marketing that I kind of try to stay fluid knowing that I know probably 5% of what's out there. And Maybe it's just because my learning curve is in a sp- specific speed. Other people can pick onto it much faster, but I've already started to like learn more in this one year than in the past six years of me working, mainly because I've taken more ownership of my education outside of work. So when it comes to social media, I would say I still haven't cracked the code for myself, but I'm starting to do that for the startup I work at. And it's really down to, I guess, three things. The first thing is not being afraid to ship content. Like if you think your content sucks, don't assume so. Yeah. Like at least yeah. post it. If no one's engaging with it or you are getting hate, then that's the signal that shows that the content you created suck, sucked. You catalog that. And you, you basically create a dashboard of like, here are all the posts that I, I published each month, each quarter, the entire year. Here are the ones that actually performed well. Here are the ones that didn't get any engagement because zero engagement is a signal in and of itself. And then you'll start to see what's working. But if, for example, for me right now, I'm starting to, I'm starting to figure out that images and posters, if you will, on LinkedIn is not enough. The next, the next experiment that I have to do is once I publish a podcast, I need to do a simple one minute video using my iPhone that I post on LinkedIn promoting the podcast. So that's the next experiment I'm going to do because I've done my first experiment of doing four months, posting only images and thumbnails of my podcast on LinkedIn, getting two to three likes or engagements even if I have a big guest. So now I know that's not working. I'm not going to give up. I'm just going to try a new content format. So the first pillar for social media marketing that I can confidently say 
works for any business and any kind of uh, brand, if you will, is just experiment with as much content as you can and catalog the performance of all that content. Yeah. The second. Uh, oh, keep going. Yeah. Keep going. So the second is if a platform releases a new feature, that is your signal to, to just go all in on that feature. If it's Twitter spaces, if it's Instagram reels, if it's LinkedIn live, the reason why these platforms are creating these new features is because they've already tested it and excuse me, beta tested it with other um, big tier profiles to know that that's where the new engagement is going to be. That's where the new eyeball, the new way to get eyeballs is going to be. So it's experimenting with content using any new feature that comes out because that's where the white space is. And then the third thing would be what we're doing right now. So collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. If you have a small audience, truly the only way to grow fast is to work with other people, whether they are your peers in the sense that they have similar smaller audiences, but they might not have um, the same followers that you have. So you can uh, do an exchange there. And if you're lucky, you can interview someone or collaborate with someone who has 5X your audience size. And that's an opportunity for you to get more people into your sphere of influence. So I would say just to summarize, one, experiment with all the content that you have. Two, use any new feature that comes available. And then three, collaborate, because that's something that works in almost any field uh, or any industry, if you will. Yeah. So there, first of all, that was great. That's really great. But um, but yeah, I mean, first of all, I highly suggest if you want a LinkedIn um, master, then check out Mark Metry's profile. Mark okay. Metry hosted Humans 2.0, uh, top 100 podcast on Apple Podcasts. And I had the luxury of being in an email chain with him a few, uh, probably a year ago. And he just blew my freaking mind. You know, like he told me, so he essentially grew his entire podcast on LinkedIn and, um, and yeah, he posted so often, produced such highly valuable content. Like one of the, one of the things that I realized is if you really want to do marketing, then if you really want to do marketing, then you really have to go all in on it. And this man really, really went all in on it. So that's, that's really solid. And then yes, definitely collab because there are a lot yeah. of things that I know that Kenny doesn't know. And there are a lot of things exactly. that Kenny knows that I don't know. So that is really, really important. And don't see it as, you know, they're your competition. Kenny's not my competition. We're just, we're in the same boat. There, there's, have you ever discussed on your podcast, Paul, Paul Graham? No. So uh, if you Google Paul Graham, I'm probably saying his last name wrong. Um, wealth, those three words on Google. I think his website is PM archive. And it's a, I think like a 20 minute read on what is wealth. And I read this article, I think at this point, once a month, because of how, how amazing it is. Wealth is anything you create. And if you see other creators as your competition, you're thinking about it the wrong way. There are other collaborators. And if the more people you collaborate with, the more wealth you're creating. What we're doing right now, we're creating wealth. This did not exist before today. And this conversation will be valuable to at least one other human being besides us two, or at the very least valuable to us two. And it's that kind of mental framework you need to keep in mind so that you're thinking with like abundance as opposed to scarcity, because people can sniff that out. And if you are constantly in competition with other people, you're going to lose out on opportunities that would have been there if you were more collaborative. Yep. Yep. And the way I like to view it is very simply, if I try to take out Kenny right now and me and him get into a fight, maybe I could take him out, but then maybe also I'm going to lose a little health along the way. And then exactly. the third person is going to come in and win. But if me and you grow time. Exactly. Right. So grow together. You know, I, I highly suggest you check out Tim Ferriss. Highly suggest you check out. There was a great podcast with Mr. Beast where he talked about the importance of this, what I'm going to link in the description below. But that is the end of our conversation. Kenny Soto, thank you for coming on and tell them where they can find you. So I love doing this. If you want to find me online, just Google my name, Kenny Soto. Done. That's it.
Nothing else. Yep. That's all you need. I own the whole first page of the SERP. Oh, he knows. He understands. Yep. All right. Awesome. Great having you on. And we will talk. Thank soon. you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Nick Lugo Show with Kenny Soto. To support this podcast, please give me a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or subscribe to my YouTube channel. And so I'll leave you with, this, with some words from Ariana Huffington. We need to accept that we won't always make the right decision. That will screw up royally sometimes, understanding that failure is not the opposite of success. It is part of success. Thank you for listening, and I hope to see you next time.